I'm Michael Bloomfield. Thanks very much um, for coming to my talk on cannabis and the brain. Um, cannabis has been around for thousands of years, um, but I want our story to start this evening here in um, China, or Indochina to be precise, um, in the middle of the 19th century. Um, around this time um, was really, really exciting because that was um, the time that saw the birth of psychiatry the birth of psychiatry as a science. And psychiatry is the medical specialty that looks after mental illnesses. There was a French psychiatrist called Jacques Joseph Moreau, and um, he wanted to go traveling. And I think he took a bit of a gap year, went on a really long voyage um, to Indochina. While he was there, he stumbled across um, hashish, which is a resin of cannabis and he was very interested by it. So he decided to bring um, quite a large amount back with him um, by sea. He arrived back in Paris, and when he did, this is him, he um, began um, testing it on himself, like any good scientist would do back in the day. He um, quite likes the effects of it, and he began to smoke it um, with his friends. And a club was set up in Paris called the Club des Echachins, the hash club, basically, where um, lots of Parisian high and, and low society would sit around and get quite stoned together. The very interesting thing at the time, he wrote a, a, a book about it, um, which um, is, is very interesting. I haven't read all of it, but I've read bits of it. His famous quote at the time is this. There is not a single elementary manifestation of mental illness that cannot be found in the mental changes caused by hashish. The wildest delirium to the most varied and disordered of feelings. Now, I think this is extremely powerful stuff. Around the same time, this time in, in what was then British India, the Indian Hemp Drugs Commission wrote a big report about the use of cannabis in, in India. And they noted then that people who smoked a lot of cannabis became lethargic. They lost interest in the world around them. Now, in my talk today, I'm going to be speaking about cannabis and the brain. To understand these, I need to call upon some of the other disciplines of, from, from science and from the humanities. There's going to be some psychology, a bit of history of medicine. I'm going to talk a lot about what my colleagues do because collaboration is very important in science. Psychiatry, as I've mentioned. Neuroscience, which is the, the multidisciplinary science of the brain. Brain imaging, so that's how we, how we take pictures of the brain. There'll be some physics. I'm not a physicist, so if you are and I say anything that's wrong, please don't be angry. There's going to be some scientific process, likewise a tiny bit of chemistry, some pharmacology. Pharmacology is the, the scientific study of drugs and their effects on the body. Um, I'm going to mention addiction. This also has implications for public health policy and indeed for legal policy, and that may inform um, some of the questions um, towards the end. Now, our understanding of how the brain works, or indeed how any part of the body works, is strongly influenced by our ideas about how nature is working around us. Now, if we go back in time to the 17th century, um, this was Descartes' book on man. And you can see some really beautiful anatomical depictions of the nervous system. So if you look on the, um, to the left there um, of, the, of the pictures, the, the guy standing up with his left hand in the air, on the right side you can see that his, the, his flesh has been dissected away and you can, see his, you can see his nerve cells. Are there any doctors or medical students here? I know there are some. <laughs> so, um, and, and I think that the really nice thing about this, although it's anatomically incorrect, um, but you can see some really beautiful things. You can see the brachial plexus um, in, the, in the right shoulder, and you can also see the optic chiasm behind the eyes um, on the, on the right-hand image. Now, they at the time had no idea. They knew that nerve signals must be sent from the brain, because if you decapitated um, a human or an animal, 
they stop living. They know that they went down to muscles, and you can see a muscle in the arm on the image on, on your right. But they didn't quite know how this was done. So at the time, they understood it in terms of something that was called animal spirits. So animal spirits were sent down from the brain. There was probably a spirit in the brain that had bells and levers and cables and pulleys. Now, we know that that isn't how the brain works. But just to hang on to that, how we understand the brain now is bound to change as our knowledge of nature changes in the future. So we know that animal spirits aren't responsible for how the brain works. So how does the brain work? There are lots and lots of nerve cells in your brain. There are roughly, give or take a few billion, 100 billion nerve cells in your brain. Now, each of those probably has roughly 1,000 to 7,000 billion um, excuse me, 1,000 to 7,000 connections. Now, if we multiply all those up, then we're in the hundreds of trillions of connections. Now, that means that there are more connections in your brain than there are stars in our galaxy, and I think that's quite an amazing thing to think about. I mean, it's, it, it's mind, it blows my mind when my mind, with all its connections, thinks about it. So... <laughs> How do these cells work? Now, in, in a nutshell, you can see there's a blue blob with a kind of purple blob in the middle. That's one what's called a cell body, which is, which is one part of the cell. Now, electrical signals get sent, down, get sent down the cells. The cells then form what are called synapses. These are connections with other cells. And remember, each one has thousands of them. Now, in the synapse, a chemical signal is released from one cell onto the next cell. Those chemicals are called neurotransmitters. We've got, we've got lots of them. You've probably heard of some common ones like serotonin, like dopamine, and I'll be coming back to dopamine later. Now, the way that nerve cells send messages down, um, down themselves are by something called action potentials. These, these are, uh, this is electrical activity going down a nerve cell. It gets to the end of the nerve cell, and then it releases chemicals onto the other cell releases the neurotransmitters. Now, there's a short video just to illustrate this that hopefully will start. If I press a button. No, I'll go back. Is there a video, please? <laughs> Great. So here's the brain. We're going to zoom in. We can see the electrical activity going down, rushing down nerve cells. There are the action potentials. How it works is there are, there are ions, so there are positive neutral ions on the outside of the cell and they rush in and they travel in a particular direction. It's very special that nerve cells fire action potentials in one direction. Now as those action potentials reach the end of the cell, they then meet um, what are called vesicles. They're the spheres, the balls that you can see. Now those balls contain the neurotransmitters. The vesicles go to the end of the cell and they release neurotransmitters, which are those kind of small bluey things there in the middle, onto what are called receptor molecules, which are these ones here on the other side. And that's how one cell talks to another. There are lots and lots of different neurotransmitters, lots of chemicals. This system is extremely sensitive. So any chemical from the outside world that affects chemicals in the brain has, has widespread effects all over the brain. Now, why study cannabis in the brain? Well, cannabis use is really, really common. About half of young people, so that's people for the definition here, this comes from a medical paper, it's not my definition, is under 30. I'm in my 30s now, so I'm no longer young. One in 10 young people, again, 30s, have, um, have used cannabis in the past month, so it, so it is quite common. And information on this is lacking here in the United Kingdom, but there's, there's good evidence in the United States, and we imagine that the picture is very, very similar over there than it is over here, that about one in 20 adults will at some point in their lives abuse cannabis, so they're using cannabis to a point where it's interfering with their lives, or become dependent on cannabis. Now, we know that using cannabis regularly over a long period of time is a risk factor for, for mental health problems, and I'll come on to that in a moment. But we also know there are lots and lots of chemicals in cannabis, and indeed some of these may be, may be, some of these may be harmful, but some of these may be beneficial. So it's really important to study. 
Now, I'm going to talk about mental illness briefly, and I want to introduce two concepts to you. The first is something called psychosis, which you've probably heard. Um, the other, if, if somebody has a psychosis, they're described as being psychotic. This has nothing to do with, with being, being a psycho, being, being a psychopath, being, being a serial killer. What psycho... That's, that's, that's being a psychopath. Um, what psychosis means... Now, this is the Oxford English D Dictionary definition, is a mental disorder in which thought and emotions are so impaired that contact is lost with external reality. And this is actually quite a helpful definition um, to have. Now, psychosis can occur in a number of mental illnesses. The one that really interests us is one called schizophrenia, which has nothing to do with split personalities. Um, it's called schizophrenia, schiz meaning schizophrenia meaning mind, because when the term was invented, they thought it was about a splitting of mental processes, splitting using a, an, a, a psychoanalytic use of the word, which no longer applies. Now, schizophrenia is, um, although there are, there are people with schizophrenia who do extremely well, it can be potentially devastating in some cases. You can get auditory hallucinations, so that's hearing a voice when there isn't somebody there talking to you. Now, we used to think auditory hallucinations were quite rare. Actually, one in ten of us here in this room will have auditory hallucinations. We'll hear a voice when there's nobody there, and, and the voice doesn't bother us, and that's normal, and there's nothing to worry about. When we, as, as, as doctors, as psychiatrists, where we, we, we classify it as being, as being a problem is when it's very distressing when voices say very hurtful things to people. So there might be a voice saying to commit suicide, saying you're worthless, you're scum, there's nothing going on. And there's nothing that can be done to stop the voice sometimes. And it can be very, very, uh, very upsetting for the individual. People can get very paranoid, very scared, be worried that they're, that they're a th that in a way that doesn't make sense, there are things out to get them. Or when people become, can become very psychotic, can believe that there are, for example, I have very strange ideas that, that aliens are out to get them or the FBI is following them or they're being spied on, etc. It's, it's a very frightening experience to have. And the other the, the, um, thing that people can get is feeling like their thoughts are being interfered with. So all of our thoughts now, most of us in this room, our thoughts are private. We experience what's going on in our own mind as being, coming from us and we're not aware of other people's thoughts. Now, if, we ha if our thoughts feel like they're being interfered with, it means you lose privacy of your own mind, and you think that pe other people can read your thoughts, that someone's controlling your thoughts. Very, very disturbing, very upsetting. Now, because of these potentially very upsetting things, schizophrenia, pe people with schizophrenia have a reduced life expectancy. And unfortunately, that's because of high rates of suicide. And there are, of course, broader impacts. People can... Will, can um, stop working, for example, it has impacts on the family, impacts on their friends, there's a wider societal impact. And because of this, it's been um, worked out as causing roughly 1% of worldwide disability. Right, so... Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about cannabis being a risk factor for psychosis. Now, this is a little bit controversial for a few reasons, which I will come to. But broadly speaking, most psychiatrists will agree that cannabis is a risk factor for psychosis. They will disagree about how much it is a risk factor. This is a diagram which shows a few different studies. And the important thing to, to note is that there are five different studies on the screen. They're done in different countries at different points in time. And broadly speaking, what they've done is they've looked at a group of people at, at time point A, and then, a, a, and then the same group of people at time point B, and they've seen which ones have smoked cannabis, which ones haven't smoked cannabis, which ones have developed psychosis, and which ones haven't. And what that shows is that there's something called an adjusted risk on the, on, on the y-axis, which is the one going up and down. And looking at these, it looks like cannabis is roughly doubling the risk of psychosis. Now, this comes with a caveat, because if cannabis use is so common, why haven't we seen cases of psychosis go up? Um, but for now, that's all I'm going to say about it. 
Now, there are different types of cannabis. There's hashish, which I've mentioned. There's normal herbal cannabis. Since these can't be imported into this country because of import restrictions, because it's an illegal drug, um, it's um, grown hydroponically. Most cannabis now in the UK comes in the form of skunk. Now, this is a picture from the Daily Mail. If you can see it clearly enough, the police officer's been photoshopped into the picture. Now, cannabis contains about, um, all, we're almost at 100 different what are called cannabinoids. They're the chemicals in cannabis. The two main ones are what's called THC, which stands for delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, and CBD, which stands for cannabidiol. In hash, the older traditional form of cannabis, these two are in equal amounts. In skunk, you can get 200, up to 200 times the amount of THC compared to CBD. And these have very different effects. So I'd now like to show you um, a clip from a BBC Three programme from one of my colleagues, Dr Paul Morrison, at the Institute of Psychiatry, um, which illustrates these because we can't consume THC and CBD here in front of you. So this is the next best thing. But are these views right? Is it really true that the skunk out there can play havoc with your mind? Here at the Institute of Psychiatry, I've agreed to take part in a unique medical trial designed to find out. It's part of their ongoing research into the link between stronger cannabis and psychosis. The scientists are interested in the effects of the ratio between the two main components of cannabis, THC and cannabinoid. So on one day, I'm being injected with pure THC, something like ultra-high potency skunk. On the other day, I get a mixture of THC and cannabinoid, more like the natural makeup of the cannabis plant. When I get the injections, I don't know what I'm getting. It turns out that this one is a mixture of THC and cannabinoid. After 10 minutes, it hits me. With the THC and cannabinoid, no matter how hard I try to take the experiment seriously, it all seems hilarious. That's Dr. Paul Morrison. Oh, I'll get you something. I'll get you something a bit soft, something like that. What does it feel like? It looks very enjoyable. My God, it's fun! <laughs> it was amazing. Amazing. With the pure THC, it's a different story. It's horrible. It's like being at a funeral. Worse. It's sort of like, um... It's just so depressing. You'd want to, um yourself. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of morbid. After 15 minutes, I begin a series of psychological tests designed to measure whether I've become psychotic, and if so, how severely. I feel agitated. No. On the THC and cannabinoid mixture, I seem really flippant. On this drug, I just don't care. I'm experiencing profound insights. Bollocks. I'm worried state of mind won't end. I don't want it to end. This experience is frightening. Strong. I feel agitated. Yeah. I do. I do. But with the pure THC, I'm suspicious. Introverted. Weird. Every question seems to have a double meaning. Trouble is, my attention's like really... It's like massively into... Just a word or something. It's like, but not in a happy. It's like in a morbid. Morbid is. That's how I feel. Morbid. It's, it's an anxiety. It's like an. It's like a panic attack. Do you know what I mean? It's like. Uh, you ask me a question. I'm thinking. I don't know the answer. 
I'm just one of many volunteers taking part in this trial. The doctors are hoping to answer some of the really important questions about cannabis and psychosis. For example, do people react differently to exactly the same dose of THC? And can cannabinoid reduce the psychotic effect of THC? It certainly made me uncontrollably giggly. Two hours later, Thanks. the effects have worn off. So just how psychotic did I get? I hope I've convinced you just with that short demonstration, or rather my colleague's demonstration, that there are clear differences between the two. All of us have different thresholds for how much of a particular drug we need to produce a, a particular effect in our body, but most of us, if we were given enough of THC, would develop psychotic symptoms. Most of us, if we were given the, given, given the, the same amount of THC with CBD, would prob probably have quite a giggly experience with it. CBD is now being trialled as an antipsychotic to treat schizophrenia and also to treat anxiety and to treat a huge number of mental health problems. And THC, we're a bit, a bit more wary of. In Colorado, where cannabis has recently been legalised, they're looking at the ratio between the two, between the two of them and having high CBD um, content um, cannabis and there was a recent story about a young girl with epilepsy um, that you may be aware of that was on BBC News a few days ago. So how do we study, that's its effects on, on the mind if you like, how do we study its effects on the brain? Until about 20 years ago the only way of doing that was either to wait until somebody died and then do a post-mortem examination on their brain, look down a microscope or to do animal tests. Because of leaps and bounds in the advances of brain imaging technology, we're able to do brain scans. I'm going to talk, I'm mindful of time, I'm going to talk very briefly about some of the different techniques that are available. So we can use magnetic resonance imaging. This uses a very, very strong magnet, um, and basically most of our body is made of water, and water has hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen spins in one particular direction. When there's a magnet around, it changes direction Basically, that's an oversimplification. But we can um, take very, very detailed pictures of the brain using MRI. We can also, using MRI, look at the function. Um, so we can look at the amount of oxygen that's being, that's being used by the brain. So that tells us how active different parts of the brain are during different tasks. We can also look at the chemical spectra. So this is the chemical signature of different parts of the brain using something called spectroscopy. And we can also look at the connections between different parts of the brain using something called diffusion tensor imaging. A completely different technique, which is the one that I particularly like, is, and, and my research is in, uses positron emission tomography. This doesn't use magnets at all. It uses something that's a bit like a radioactive dye. So here are two pictures um, of, of a structural MRI brain scan. And the image on your left is a cross-section going, going this way. The image on the right is a slice going this way. Just very quickly, the night for those of you who aren't doctors or medical students, um, the anatomy is really beautifully demonstrated. In case you're disorientated, you can see the nose there. The tongue is, I'm always surprised how big the tongue is. It's enormous. You can see the spinal cord there, the back of the brain, that's your occipital cortex, that's what you, where your primary visual cortex is, so that's the bit of your brain that does the seeing, if you like, and the front of your brain where your executive function, your, your higher brain functions happen. In this, in the image on your right, you can see the eyeballs there and there. You can see, if you, if you can track the optic nerves coming in and the muscles, you can just make out the lenses at the front of the eyes. And then there's all the brain structure. The, the grey bits of brain are where your grey cells are, your little grey cells, as Pyro used to call them. The white bits are the connections between them. We can look at function. This is fMRI. Um, this is a study looking at people who have schizophrenia and people who don't have schizophrenia. The key thing, really, for you to see is that um, there, are, there are differences between the two of them. The red bits mean that a part of the brain is more active um, than the non-red bits, basically. So you can see, if you look at the image, the image above, that's got more red than the image below, and we can basically look for differences. Um, MRS, this looks at the chemical signature for different parts of the brain. We place um, a, a, a cube called a voxel here, 
And you can see here, this is looking at a tumour, I think. Um, but you can see the, the voxels placed over the tumour in the image above. It's placed on the other side of the brain, the image below. This is the chemical signature. This is the spectra. Each line here represents a different chemical that's in the brain. You can see there's a difference between, between the two of them. And so that difference can be analysed. This is diffusion tensor imaging. So this is, um, these produce really beautiful images of the connections between different parts of the brain. And we know that people who smoke cannabis regularly have altered connections between the different parts of their brain. So I'm going to speak briefly about positron emission tomography. This is a way of measuring brain chemicals directly. So we use a radioactive dye to, to measure brain chemicals. This is an image of a PET scan that you can see. It's actually an image of my brain. And um, the red bits in the middle uh, where there's lots of dopamine and the blue bits around are where there aren't. Now, we can measure those in lots of people. And this has been done in the, um, in the, in the figure on your right. Um, what this is, is it's looking at different studies that have measured dopamine in people who have schizophrenia and people who don't have schizophrenia. And um, as you can see, there's, there's a... So, um, this uh, x-axis, um, if it's more on the right, it means that there's more dopamine. If it's more on the left, it means there's less dopamine. And these studies all kind of agree with each other that there's more dopamine in this particular part of the brain called the striatum in people who have schizophrenia, generally speaking, than people who don't. Um, this is an, a picture of a cyclotron, which is how we make the dye. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, the... It's called positron emission tomography because the dye gives off positrons. Positrons are antimatter electrons. It's getting a bit Star Trek-y. The um, antimatter electrons, called positrons, come off from the dye. They meet a normal electron, which we all have in our bodies. They annihilate each other. They give off um, radiation. They give off two high-energy gamma photons in opposite directions. They're detected by the scanner. Um, this is a very, very short piece of film, which we're going to play now, please. Thank you. So there are the positrons. They've come off the dye. They're sw swimming around in your body. They travel a very, very short distance. They bump into an electron, and boom, they annihilate each other, and they send two high-energy photons in opposite directions. That's detected by the scanner. This is a typical PET scanner, so the, the patient or the subject will um, lie down there. Then they'll go into the scanner. That's got, in effect, gamma cameras. Um, around that detects the, 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 the high-energy photons. So in our study, we wanted to see whether people, because people with schizophrenia have lots of dopamine, we wanted to see if people with, um, who smoke lots of cannabis also, also had that. So we formed a, a scientific hypothesis, which then we wanted to test. Now, so our hypothesis was that cannabis users would have more dopamine than people who don't smoke cannabis. And as you can see... Um, that wasn't true. Um, we found the opposite. Now, initially, when I looked at the results, they were equal. And then when I reanalyzed everything again, because I thought my boss would be furious at me um, for going against this hypothesis, um, I found that the, the cannabis users were less. Now, when we subdivided the cannabis users, this is, if you look at the image um, on the right, so the blue dots are people who don't smoke cannabis, and the green dots are people who do smoke cannabis. People who were dependent or abusing cannabis had much lower levels of dopamine than people who, who were using cannabis but weren't addicted. Now, this is interesting because in other drugs of addiction, you get similar effects. You get what's, a, what, what's described as a blunted dopamine system, a dopamine system that isn't doing what it should do. And we found relationships between um, the, the amount of cannabis that people were taking which is the figure on your left. There's a, there's a nice relationship between the amount of cannabis people were smoking and their dopamine levels, and the, importantly, the age at which they first started smoking cannabis. Now, we can't say that one's cause and effect because of the design of this study, but, and it could be that the, these findings are by chance, and if it was repeated, that you don't find this. But this is quite strong evidence that cannabis is causing it. An alternative way of looking at it is that people with low dopamine are more likely to smoke cannabis in the first place. So our interpretation of our findings were that they went against our, our hypothesis and that cannabis users had had lower dopamine production. 
Now, dopamine does lots of things. One of the things that it, it's involved in is our, our motivation to do things around us. And we know that there's this story, as I said, that goes back almost 200 years now about people smoking lots of cannabis, having low motivation levels. So we said um, it might underlie a motivation, a motivation, lack of motivation. Um, so the Daily Mail picked the story up and um, they say smoking cannabis really does make people lazy um, because it affects an area of their brain responsible for motivation. Now, um, we, we didn't measure la laziness levels. Um, but, um, but it, it made the headlines, and, and that was great for us, quite frankly. Um, so the other bits of the story are, uh, 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 as we would describe them, long-term use of the drug lowers the feel-good chemical dopamine. Previous studies say that it causes lethargy and apathy, and that some experts talk about the amotivational system syndrome. Others feel it doesn't exist. Um, if you have questions for me on that, I'll answer them at the end, just so I can move on. So we did a follow-up study where we didn't measure their laziness levels, but we gave them a questionnaire to fill in that said, basically asks, how motivated are you? What are your energy levels like? And we found a really strong relationship between their dopamine levels. So that's the y-axis here, are their dopamine levels. This AES score is the um, apathy evaluation scale self. Um, basically, the more, the, the more you are here on the scale, the more apathetic you feel. And you can see here that those ones that are over here tend to have low dopamine levels. Those ones up there tend to have high. Now, this is done in a relatively small number of people, but for a, a PET study, this is actually a good sample size. Now, cannabis isn't all bad, and one of the things I want to leave you with is, is this research that's done by, by, by David, Professor David Nutt, who's based here at Imperial College too. And this looks at the relative harms of different drugs. Now, cannabis is there in the middle, and this is based on harm to the individual from using the drug and the harm to society. Now, the, the way that this has been done is a bit controversial. Scientists will disagree about it, but it illustrates a point that a few experts in the field have said, that the most dangerous drug that exists is alcohol. The one after that's heroin, followed by crack cocaine, we go down the list, tobacco's up there, and cannabis um, is beneath it there. Now, some of the things that I've talked about, the, some of the history, some of the, some of the behavioral experiments, positron emission tomography, these, these are all actually featured in a really fantastic exhibition at the Science Museum, which is called Mind Map Stories from Psychology. I went to see it on Saturday, and I thought it was excellent. Um, so if you fancy going, I'd really recommend it. Um, I want to acknowledge um, lots of people, in particular Oliver Howes, who I work with um, at Hammersmith Hospital, my colleague Ilias, Michelle's here as well, um, um, Val Curran and Celia Morgan, who work at University College London, who we've collaborated with, a whole bunch of people at the Institute of Psychiatry, and also Professor David Nutt's team, who are based um, here at Imperial too. Thank you very much.